All right, and we are here with Carrie Wedler, uh, and she's going to talk to us tonight about how to stay calm with all the news that's going on and everything else and stuff like that. And uh, so, why don't we start off with some of the questions? <laughs> and I think I think it would be appropriate to start with who is who who is Carrie Wedler? We'll edit that. Who who are you? Tell us about yourself. So I don't even know what to call myself anymore. For a long time, I was editor-in-chief of the antimedia.org. We no longer exist in the capacity we used to due to some bans on Facebook and Twitter last year. But I found myself in activism several, I actually want to say seven, eight years ago, I started making videos. Um, I had voted for Barack Obama very proudly in 2008. And... Come 2011, the Arab Spring was coming up, things were happening in the world, and I realized I had no idea what was going on. I had voted, I had participated in the system, but I was not keeping track of the system. And when I started realizing that Barack Obama had expanded a lot of the wars George Bush had started, I decided that I cared because I came from a democratic background. I'm from Los Angeles. I was raised just to believe that blue was good and red was bad. And the faith I had put in Obama he didn't live up to it. I'll say that. And I just felt like it was somebody's responsibility to start speaking out. I had always wished I'd grown up in the 1960s so I could have protested the Vietnam War. So war was always a really big issue for me. And it continued even when a Democrat was president. And I went from there. And then went from there. And all right. So and that goes right into one of the next questions, one of the other questions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, wow. Okay, so it says, I always see her critiquing the corporate establishment, gun control, foreign policy, etc. I wonder what her vision for the future is. Like, did she just realize the government was full of it after Obama and then fell into libertarian and ancapism? Is she not revolutionary minded at all, but just wants more old school conservatism? Also, who hurt you, Carrie? You always seem mad. <laughs> Okay, you're going to have to keep me on track here because there's a lot of moving parts to this question. Uh -huh. I think there's a little confusion because whoever asked this question seems to think I'm both a libertarian and a conservative. The, uh, those two don't coincide to me. Uh, just as much as libertarians can coincide with people on the left, they can coincide with people on the right economically, whereas on the left it tends to be a little bit more civil liberties oriented. But nonetheless, um, let's see. Uh, Am I not revolutionary minded at all? I feel like I am. Um, I believe I prefer evolution more than I prefer revolution. I my solution is not violence in the streets and you know taking down the government with guns as much as I support gun rights. I don't think that that's going to be a sustainable long term solution. I'm a big proponent of agorism. If anyone in your audience has heard of it, I'm sure they have. Where you're basically just participating in counter economic activity to challenge a lot of the injustice that's been perpetuated by the system. So. For example, if you look at occupational licensing laws, these are terrible and they put a really big burden on the poor, often minorities. It keeps people from making a living because they have to jump through all these hoops and all this government required training. So just a quick example, what if I got my hair cut by someone who didn't have the correct government license? That would be an act of defiance. And I know maybe it sounds silly and it sounds stupid, but all of these acts adding up, someone, you know, a parent using CBD to treat their child with seizures in a state where it's illegal, that, would be agorism. You're participating in something that not only undermines the pharmaceutical industry, which is very entrenched with government, but you're also, you're just taking a different way. You're breaking the law at the end of the day, it's civil disobedience. And I think that all of these actions can add up to really make a difference and not so much revolutionize our paradigm and tear down the government, but instead just create a more cooperative community-based way of living as opposed to relying on a giant federal government and even state governments, local governments that can be very corrupt. And I didn't forget the question, who hurt me? This is actually very essential to <laughs> the entire conversation I think we're supposed to be having. Um, mm -hmm. Who hurt me first? That would be my parents when they got divorced. And a lot of my life and a lot of my emotional healing process has been dealing with these childhood wounds. And I don't want to be presumptuous, but I feel like this is the case for a lot of people. Children are very sensitive. We are very prone to being misunderstood and not having our needs met because we're being raised by other human beings who probably also didn't have their needs met. And so this was not something that had occurred to me or mattered to me at all when I started making videos. But over the last few years, 
um, this person said I'm always mad. Um, yeah, sometimes I am in my videos, but I started to realize that that's not a sustainable way to live. I don't want to be angry all the time. And I think for me, it's been an interesting line to walk and an inter interesting balance to try to strike because on one hand, it's very legitimate to be angry about everything that's going on in the world. But on the other hand, I had to start examining that younger trauma, those younger experiences I had and really start to get real with myself about how much of my reactions to what was going on in the world were actually something that was triggered in me on something that has nothing to do with government, but there were some common themes. So for example, I, I just talked about this in a speech, so I'll use this. When we lost the anti-media last year, one of the feelings that was coming up for me was like hopeless. I feel silenced. Imagine that. Those were feelings that were coming up for me when my parents got divorced that I only came back and realized years and years later. So for me, who hurt me is actually a really big question. And it's really important, in my opinion, moving forward as a society, as we try to get more freedom and justice and peace in this world. All right. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Bo? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That, that, was, that was a lot in, in a real short amount of time. I mean, that was, that, was a, that was a whole, man, I hope your parents don't watch this. Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, they know. They know. And I, I, that's the beauty of the healing process is they're human too. I'm human. I love my parents. I've always loved my parents and they love me so much. And it's been a really beautiful process to try to heal from that. All right. So... One of the questions I get a lot is, you know, how do you stay centered and how do you do this with everything that's going on in the world? How do you not just end up angry throwing stuff at the camera? And I, I don't have an answer to that. So that's why you're here. Help people right now. Make them make them feel better. How how what are some <laughs> right this moment? Fix everything. How uh, give me some solutions on how to maintain center with all of this going on. Sure. Well, um, so for people who don't know, Bo is my personal friend, and I'm very, very lucky and grateful for that. Uh, but he knows that I've had a hard time the last year. So I don't want to speak from a place of having all the answers and knowing every solution. And like, I have this recipe for how to be happy and how to change the world. I don't, not at all. Uh, all I can share is what has helped me. So the first thing that ever helped me was I found yoga. So I'm from Los Angeles. And there's a big yoga community here. And I've been making videos I don't know, not more than six months when I found yoga, but I just found myself really agitated and really antsy. And I went to my first yoga class that really resonated with me. I'd gone before and it just didn't click. So if you go to a yoga class and you don't like the teacher, go to another one before you click. That's my first advice, but it just resonated. And what yoga is essentially is it's a moving meditation. So it's really a meditation practice because you're taking the time to be present, to focus on your body, to focus on your breath. And that helps bring a little bit of calm. So by the time you finish a yoga class, whether it's like a workout yoga class or a deep stretching yoga class, if you've put in even just the tiniest little bit of effort to be present, that can be intensely calming. Uh, the same goes for actual, an actual meditation practice. So I meditate daily. That I started doing three years ago maybe because again, I was getting online. I was just waking up, pulling out my phone, pulling up Facebook, and it was agitating. It was not fun. It made me angry from the second I woke up. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. So I implemented a practice where I meditate. It's gone up over the years, but I started with 10 minutes a day in the morning before I did anything else. No Instagram for me, no Facebook. And that really sets the tone for the day. And it sort of helps you realize what's worth it. You know, so I used to be very engaged in comments and I used to be very reactive. I was going to use a dirty word, but I'll say reactive. I was very reactive. And by focusing on this presence, on trying to cultivate just a calmer mindset, it has made it easier for me to be like, you know what? I don't need to respond to that person. And if I do, I'm going to reread the comment before I post it. I'm going to take out any sassiness. I'm going to take out any sarcasm. However, so I can recommend yoga. I, I can recommend meditation. And these are wonderful day-to-day -day tools. But to bring it back to who hurt me, I really think that unless we're getting to the deeper sources of our conflict and our suffering, we're going to be reactive no matter what. I can do all the yoga in the world. And I did do all the yoga in the world. I became a yoga teacher and I still found myself struggling with much deeper issues. And after a while, the high of the yoga, the high of the meditation wears off. So you kind of 
you have to get real with yourself. And I'm saying this as someone who's still learning how to do that. So <laughs> it's a day-to-day -day process uh, in addition to these mindfulness practices that I think are really helpful. And I'd like to recommend before I forget, because we're talking about these things, I think someone that a lot of your viewers would appreciate, her name is Tara Brock, B-R-A-C-H. And she is a former therapist. She's a meditation teacher. She's very deep into Buddhism, but she does a lot of great podcasts talking about how to cope and how to deal with the current state of the world. I'm fairly confident she shares a lot of the political persuasions as your audience probably does. So I think that would be a wonderful jumping off point. I mean, that's my go-to when I am just like stressing out and yoga is not cutting it. I just light some candles. I do some deep stretch yoga. I put my headphones in and I listen to Tara. And she really helps me through it. And she's really big on, you know, we're talking about being angry at the world and something that she talks about that I think is incredibly helpful and useful and really gets to the root of healing is looking at what's underneath the anger. So when you're finding yourself angry, this is an example she uses in a podcast. She talks about the Iraq war in 2003. And she was so angry. She just was waking up in the morning and like she felt hatred flowing through her until she paused. She did. It's called a sacred pause in this practice. And she stopped to think about the more vulnerable emotions underneath. Well, what was she feeling? She was feeling really scared that a bunch of innocent people were going to die. She was scared that power could be this out of control. And by tapping into that softer emotion, she was able to connect more deeply with others around her. And that's a big one for me, because if you have seen my videos, you know, I can be very, you know, I've had to work on that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you are, you are so West Coast. Um, so yeah bring that the idea of meditation bring that to people more like me i mean you've had this conversation with me meditation doesn't necessarily mean sitting on the floor with candles around you legs crossed and humming what are some other examples that are maybe more practical for people that live this side of the mississippi <laughs> okay well i'm not that familiar with outside of the country but i would say you know yeah like meditation doesn't have to be sitting on a cushion and sitting up straight and, you know, being uncomfortable because your back hurts because you've been sitting for 15 minutes straight. For me, meditation is anything that brings you into the present moment, that brings you out of that mental chatter and that loop. And I have a lot of mental chatter and a lot of loops. They go all the time. So it could be something like going for a hike. Do you like nature? Do you feel present in nature? Is that something that really makes you feel like you're experiencing the moment? That is a meditation to me. Don't like, don't tell other meditation teachers I said that because I don't know. But for me, that's, that is a meditation, whatever brings, maybe it's playing music, maybe it's writing music, you know, just something that you feel a sense of center and it's hard to explain, but meditation in its essence, it, it sounds so esoteric, but it really is just bringing attention to the present moment. And when I used to teach yoga, I would tell my students, because I needed to hear this, it doesn't matter if your mind wanders a thousand times in 20 minutes. All that matters is that you notice. And that there is the meditation. It's not keeping a quiet mind and never having a thought run through it and then you have peace. Not at all. It's simply being aware of it and accepting that it's there. Because I went through a long phase where I, I was meditating every day, but I was coming out of the meditations more irritated because I couldn't shut my mind up. So I'd sit there for 10 minutes. And I'd be like trying to focus on the breath, but then I'd just be mean to myself. Like, Carrie, what's wrong with you? How come you can't do this? And then what does the mind want to do more? It wants to go even more. So a big part of my practice has been just accepting what's here, acknowledging it, and gently guiding yourself back. Like, it doesn't help me to be mean to myself. I've def I've, that is a lesson I've learned very well over the years. It's not going to add to anything to your life. It's only going to worsen the suffering. All right. Okay. So I want to jump back to some more of these questions because there's some, no, I mean, there's some good ones. Uh, let's see. Uh, your opinion on how to make people understand they need to take a skeptical view of any media sources. How do you, how do you tell people that they need to uh, not trust the Washington Post or whoever? Well, I think it essentially, it's not about whether it's a corporate outlet. It's not about whether it's independent because something I've noticed a lot in independent media is a lot of the audiences and a lot of the people who create the media themselves tend to think, well, if it's not mainstream media, it's good. It, they must be telling the truth. They're going against the narrative. Therefore, I'm not going to fact check anything they say. I'm just going to assume that it's true because it confirms my biases. And the same thing goes for the mainstream media. Um, I did see a comment saying that I shouldn't call them the lying mainstream media. And I do want to address that only because as an anti-war activist, uh, yeah, they have perpetuated lies many times over the decades, uh, very much without question. So 
Um, that doesn't mean that everything they publish is false. Absolutely not. In fact, I'm sure that the vast majority of what they're reporting is true. It might have some political spin on it. And the same goes for independent media. But for me, it's it's just been a long, long trajectory of learning to think for myself and know the value in that. Because again, I was raised as a Democrat. I didn't question anything. I was one of those kids who like loved to sit up straight in school with my hands folded on the desk, you know, and like wait for the teacher to tell me I was good. Like I got a lot of validation from that. I really, I'm not your typical anarchist. Like most people are like, I always knew it was all a joke and a lie, but like not me. I didn't know. I really took it seriously. And I got a lot of, I, I really liked, I really liked being in line. So for me, I've had to challenge myself and it's been a, a, I went to public school all through school. I went to UCLA. That's another public university. Like I, I'm fully steeped in the public education system. And it doesn't mean that everything I learned there is wrong, but it does mean that it's been very helpful upon asking questions just to leave room for the fact that maybe just because someone works for a blue check organization that's branded truthful by the establishment, that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. And the same goes for independent media. Like I have had many, I've had, I've fought many battles within the independent media circle about fact checking and, and making sure that we're reporting responsibly and without sensationalism. So I don't, I don't want to come off like I'm one of those, like I, I, another lesson for me has been not everything is black and white. So it's not mainstream media bad, independent media good, not at all. I think there's good in both. And that's the beauty of it is as individuals, we have the power and the capability to check things for ourselves, but we just have to be serious about it. All right. So, what are okay? So, what are you doing now? Like, you're you're at you're where you are now. You were editor in chief of Anti Media. Where are you going now? Because I heard that you were going to edit the fifth column. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> no, still not happening. All right. Worth well, I have. I have been editing some videos for this YouTube sensation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you may have heard of him. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I, I would really like to make more videos. I've, I've really taken this time um, this past year. It's been over a year since we lost the media and I didn't intend to take this much time off and to myself and, you know, really take a break from videos, but it turned out that that's what I needed. So I've just been tending to myself because I was told that this interview was going to be about coping and emotions. And so I really want to bring it back to that because that's, I can't do anything else if I'm not taking care of myself. And I realized I burned myself out constantly making content con constantly. Oh my gosh. I'm talking to somebody who makes a video a day and I used to make one a week, like at my peak, but nonetheless, like that's a lot for me. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been taking the time to really go inward. And I really think that's important for the long-term healing of the world. So many of us are acting unconsciously. And I don't mean that as a judgment. It, I just mean there isn't much pause between what we think or we feel and how we release it into the world. And I'm so guilty of that. I just found a video today where there's some sass, you know, and we can't be perfect all the time, but um, I would like to continue my emotional exploration. I'd like to share more of that with my audience because I'm so strictly political now, but that's really not all of who I am. I'd say that this internal exploration is just as much if not more but I would like to get back to making videos and I have some in the works actually and a lot of them are just challenging authority political authority that's philosophically what matters to me because I found that being out of the news cycle is actually kind of nice for my mental health I mean it's important to be informed but it's nice not to be on reddit and like 17 other sites every day just like oh look at these horrible things that happened all the they're always happening right but there's also a lot of positive things. So I, I also like to highlight solutions as well. So as far as we're moving forward in, in, in the U.S. and everything, and eventually Trump will be gone. Now, all the stuff we're talking about with coping, is, is there something that's going to parallel to that on a collective level, on a national level? And if so, you have any idea on how we as individuals can help that healing process who hurt us and all of that? Well, I mean, judging by the way people reacted to Marianne Williamson, I don't think that we're going to find a way to blend spirituality and emotional healing with politics. I, that just doesn't seem likely to me. It would be really cool, but I just don't, I, I kind of see them as opposed. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is the individual level. And I'm sure there are people who are going to be like, she's a libertarian. Of course, she thinks it's all individualism. But to bring it back to Tara Brock, I mean, this is someone who 
she's not a libertarian. I can guarantee you that. Um, but it's still at the end of the day, we have to be responsible for our own healing just as much as we have to be responsible for what goes on in the world. And it can seem like we can't make much of a difference, but I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more systemic answer because and I want to explain for a second, just because the reason I think that we can't blend emotional healing and spirituality with government and politics and political so-called solutions is that politics derives its authority through violence. I mean, why do you do what the police tell you to? Because they have a gun, like, right? Like, why do you obey? Assuming that you're not committing, you're not harming someone. It's because you can be thrown in a cage if you violate the rules. So I don't see an institution that inherently is based on violence or the threat of it. I don't see that really being a great arena for becoming more peaceful as individuals. But uh, yeah, I think I think community really does matter though. And I think oftentimes in our political paradigm, community is confused for the electorate. Whereas community can be the people you live around. It can be the entire world. I like to think of every human being as my community, but it really does come down to finding people that you can have as a support system who share values with you, but also really taking responsibility for yourself because I have spent a lot of time in my life blaming other people for why I was unhappy and why I couldn't find peace. And as it turned out, it was all within me. And I know that sounds like California hippie stuff, but it, it's, it's been true for me. And all I can do is speak what's true for me. All right. Well, that actually jumps right into this other question over here. Um, how is anti-statism possible without violence? Well, we actually kind of touched on it. So I'm talking mm -hmm. about agorism, um, where you don't have to be violent to participate in markets that are outside of government control. I think that's a, a big one. But I also, for me, the question is, how can anti-statism be violent? And I know you probably disagree with me, but if we're talking about the nature of violence that really colors the state and we look at human history, I, and maybe you can correct me here, I, I'm totally open to it, but I am yet to see a situation where violently overthrowing a government leads to anything other than another violent government that eventually devolves into corruption and injustice. But by all means, correct me, because I feel like you know more than I do about violent revolution. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're, you're right. I mean, that, that should be the very, very, very last, last tool in the toolbox, um, because if you employ violence, you're, the best you can hope for is to get a little bit closer to your goal. You're not actually going to get to utopia. You're just going to maybe take one step there if you're lucky, or you may end up with something even worse. So, uh, all but right. Also, just oh. real quick before you, I don't know if we're changing the subject, but I do just want to say as far as, I know that I keep talking about emotions and healing and childhood trauma, but I mean, if you look at some of the most corrupt people in politics, like, I don't have to like Donald Trump, Trump to be able to understand that he probably had a tough time growing up, like with whatever kind of father he had, with whatever kind of experiences, you know, I think he was acting out pretty young. And maybe if someone had come to him and been like, hey, Donnie, like, what are you feeling right now? Are you, oh my gosh, of course you're feeling angry about this, like to, to have validated his feelings, you know, and like, let him be seen as a child. Like, and again, this doesn't mean I support anything Donald Trump does, but trying to look at it without my politics coloring anything else. I mean, I think most people who do bad things have some sort of trauma. So before we move on, I just wanted to stick that in there as far as, you know, violent authoritarians and people in power go. Okay. Well, one of the <laughs> things I'm going to add, yeah, I don't know, I, I don't know about okay. all of that, but, <laughs> that, you know, that, that's why other people are coming on because we, we need some other viewpoints here. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I'm going to ask everybody that comes on is give me a solution to something some problem that the world is facing, the country is facing, whatever, give me a solution that is going to, one thing that people can do that will help solve some of it, most of it, a big piece of it, something. Sure, well, I, my big one is emotional healing, but I feel like we have already covered that in depth. So I'm gonna go with something really simple that I have discovered as I have gone searching for positive news. I hope it doesn't sound meaningless, but honestly, planting trees. I don't know if anyone saw the recent study or analysis that showed that that is actually an incredibly effective way to mitigate carbon dioxide. And no, it is not the only solution. It's not like, oh, we each plant a seed and all of a sudden no more climate change or all of a sudden the environment is fixed, but it's actually very accessible. You can either do it yourself or you can support any range of organizations that 
we'll put proceeds towards planting trees. So there, there are specific environmental groups. And then there's one, for example, like a search engine. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's like Eco, S-I-A, Ecosia, Ecosia. And they take the ad revenue from your searches and they put it towards planting trees. And I think that's such a simple and lovely solution. And I know that it's not going to fix everything. I know that I, I've been yelled at in comments many, many times, no matter what solutions I put forth, somebody's mad and somebody wants to tell me that it's not going to fix everything. But I think this is a really sweet one. And I think it's so symbolic of new beginnings. Have, have you seen the whole team trees thing that's taking over YouTube? No. Okay. So Short version for those people that don't know, uh, there's a guy named Mr. Beast who I kind of made fun of when I actually made my little video about it. But after looking at it, because people are like, you're reading this guy wrong. And I look, I'm like, yeah, okay. So he does actually do a lot of charity work with the money that he makes, but he does all these crazy stunts. Currently, he's trying to raise $20 million to plant 20 million trees with the Arbor Day Foundation. And the last time I checked, I think they were almost to six. And it's only been going on like three days. So, yeah, everybody check out that hashtag. It's on Twitter. It's on YouTube everywhere. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's definitely great. And I, of course, would add fruit trees to that. Make fruit trees so you can help with food insecurity as well. Okay, so parting shot. What do you got? What do you, what do you want to tell everybody? Well, and I, I actually, this came quite smoothly because of what you said. Did, were you just saying that they raised more money than they were anticipating, than their goal for the trees? Uh, uh, not they're yet. almost there? They're at 6 million. They want to do 20 million, okay. um, but they've only been doing it like four days. So, right. <laughs> I mean, exactly. they're, they're going to get there. <laughs> exactly. And that, you know, I know, you know, I can be sassy in my videos, but to me, like that is so inspiring. And that's so, it gives me so much optimism because that's not the only place we see individuals taking collective action on their own without anyone forcing them to. I believe many of your viewers or listeners will remember after the election, how many people raised how many millions of dollars for Planned Parenthood because they thought that it was going to be threatened. What a wonderful way to organize society because when things are essential and people care, they take action and they support it. Look at the Cajun Navy. I know you've been very active, Bo, in all of your support for hurricane victims. And it's there's so many decentralized solutions going on, so many people who care. And I think that we see the political system and we see all the bickering and we see the venom, really. People are there. There's so much contempt for each other. But when you look outside of politics and you look at people just living their lives day to day and expressing that they care about things. I think there's so much hope and there's so much room for innovation and and helping others. I just signed up to uh, volunteer to dog shelter. So that's my my latest thing. My one little drop in the bucket, my next one, that's what I'm gonna be doing. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that's it. Let me scan through these questions one more time. Okay. Uh, see if there's anything else that was... Uh, Get family and friends off of CNN, MSNBC, Fox. Uh, is it, that's a good question that you might have some insight into. Why does America continuously push its core issues down the road and onto generation after generation rather than face its problems head on and conquer them for everybody's betterment? That is a wonderful question that I feel could be answered in a thousand different ways that would all be correct. Um, but something I see, actually, I wanted to make a video about it at some point, and surprise, surprise, I never did. But I think there's a, a very strong culture in this country of avoidance. Like, oh, I don't want to deal with that right now. Let's deal with it later. You, you're sad. Take a pill for that. You know, you don't you don't you want to be skinny. Take a pill for that. You know, and I'm not saying that pills are inherently bad. That's not what I'm saying. But everything seems like a quick fix where everything's a band-aid. And I, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. I don't know if it's politics that have turned people to look for quick solutions or whether it's a culture that then pushes people to want them. But it seems like, as the question acknowledges, this has been happening for a very long time. I don't know if it's the nature of politics because the problems tend to just keep mounting. I mean, how big is the debt now? It's like $22.5 trillion. That you know, that could be relevant for, you know, like since we're going to have to pay for it, but I don't see many candidates talking about it. Certainly Donald Trump isn't talking about it. Donald Trump is bragging about or pushing for negative interest rates with the Fed and then saying he's taking on, well, I don't know that he's saying he's taking on the Fed, but his supporters actually think that he's challenging the Federal Reserve. 
by saying that there should be negative interest rates. And, you know, I'm not an economist, but I don't think that that's how you get your way out of debt. It just, you know, um, so it's, it is, it is systemic. Um, I don't, I'm not going to say I know exactly why I, I don't like to pretend like I know things I don't, but I do think it's in the culture, that kind of avoidance. Are you still a supporter of cryptocurrency? I am. Yeah. I'm not active in the cryptocurrency community, but I have my little, my little sum of crypto that I, I hoard and I hodl. Um, and I, and I do think speaking that, you know, we were just talking about the federal reserve, that's another form of agorism. This is a competing currency. The dollar is not really serving everyone. Well, you know, I, the way it's been distributed, the way it's controlled. So I think options like cryptocurrency, especially in developing countries that takes out the middleman, it takes out the bank. That's huge. And there's a greater level of privacy as even though there's a blockchain, I mean, you don't have a bank that has all of your records. So yeah, I love cryptocurrency. I'm not an expert, but I do appreciate the potential. What? All right. So one more. Okay. Give us something else on healing, coping, something like that. And just we'll, we'll, we'll kind of close out on that. And when are you going to start doing videos on that topic, which is something I heard somebody told you to do? Yes. Um, I actually have a script written for that, but I'm going to have someone else record the audio for me. So uh, that'll be coming out when she does that. But I think the, the one thing I want to share, it's so basic, but it's also so not taught to us. Anything, forget everything I said, honestly, if anything could help bring you, and this is of course in my experience, but if anything could help bring you towards a little bit more calm, towards a little bit more healing, a little bit more awareness of less reactivity, I would say just start to become curious about what comes up for you. Say you're watching Donald Trump and he's just saying something awful that like really makes you mad, you know, like the kind of thing that just makes you want to record a video right away and like yell at the internet, you know, like when that comes up, whether it's about Donald Trump, whether it's about someone in your personal life, just setting the intention to pause and explore that. Where am I feeling it? What am I feeling? I tend to feel things in my chest, like right in my heart. A lot of people feel it in their stomach. They feel it in their throat. Just becoming curious about that inner world and the experience we have. And instead of fighting it, instead of being like, oh, oh no, I'm angry. I got to get rid of it. Instead, just be like, hmm, okay, I'm angry. That's here right now. And that way, when you add that little bit of mindfulness to it, there's a much smaller chance that you're going to put it back out into the world. And that is a big lesson for me. And it's, for me, it's been emotions 101. So if you're someone who, you know, doesn't like to get into their feelings or isn't familiar with their feelings, that would be a great place to start. All right. Okay. So plug whatever it is you want to plug and, and we'll get out of here. Sure. You can find me on YouTube, Carrie Wedler, C-A-R-E-Y-W-E-D as in dog, L-E-R. You can find me on Instagram. I am banned from Twitter, but my, my, Ha ha ha. It's so funny that I'm banned from Twitter. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. Um, I'm also on Steemit and Minds. I like to support those alternative decentralized social media options. That's another form of fighting the establishment. You can find me on all those. All right. All right, everybody. And we will be, uh, if you're listening on the podcast, we'll be back with something. I'm not sure what's next uh, right after this. And if you're going to be watching this on YouTube, y'all have a good night. Okay, we're done. Not yet. Hang on. Okay.